Were the prophets incredible people? Were the kings of Israel incredible people? Were the disciples who we heard proclaiming God's word today in our readings, were they incredible people? Well, if you know anything about the Bible, the short answer to all those questions is no. They were not. In fact, if you read your Bible, the Bible is full of sexually immoral people, liars, cowards, and pretty much every other form of sinfulness you can think of. And the prophets, the kings, and the disciples are no exception to this. Yet today we celebrate. Today we celebrate because the non-incredible people of God receive an incredible gift, all demonstrating how incredible our God is. After all, that is the message of the church. The message of the church is not a put-together people who have it all figured out, who are better than everyone else. The message of the church are a broken, contrite, and sinful people living in the grace of an incredible, loving God who decided to reveal His love to us in Jesus and who has now sent us, not by ourselves but with the Holy Spirit, to tell others about Him, not ourselves. So today we celebrate. We celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit given to us who believe. The third person of our triune God whom we worship, and if we're being honest, the one most difficult for us to understand. But fortunately, God has revealed Him to us And not only that, but sent Him to dwell inside of us. This focus on Pentecost is the disciples, because God the Father at Jesus' request has sent them, non-incredible people, an incredible gift, the very Spirit of truth, who's going to bring to mind all the things that they have heard from Jesus, whom they've been with from the beginning so that they can share Jesus and the mighty works of God to the ends of the earth. Now, the people might not have been incredible, but the event itself was. The way it's described in Acts chapter 2, there's a loud rushing wind, loud enough that it draws thousands of people to where the disciples are, and tongues of fire are resting on their heads. I mean, can you imagine you would stop paying attention to my sermon in a moment if even one person in here had a tongue of fire on their heads, much less 12. And then not only that, but when those people who are gathered by the loud sound come, they find a bunch of Galilean fishermen and tax collectors all speaking to them in their own native languages. Now, if any of you have ever tried to learn another language, you know it's quite difficult. It takes many years of practice. And the best way is to immerse yourself in a culture and a country where that's the language being spoken. The disciples didn't do any of that. And yet, here they are speaking in a language that they previously didn't know. How different the disciples are. How different they are today than what we've been seeing from them for the last few months. Let's take a look at a few examples of the disciples prior to today to really understand the magnitude of what God has given each of us. Now, not through a loud rushing wind and and tongues of fire, but instead through the waters of holy baptism. So first, we'll look at Thomas the unbeliever. After Jesus dies and rises from the grave, and even after the other disciples have seen Jesus And they said, we've seen him, he's alive. Thomas refuses to believe because Thomas isn't an incredible person. He's a normal person. If you've often thought to yourself, man, if I was in this Bible story, I'm not sure I would believe what Jesus is saying. You're probably right. You wouldn't because you're not an incredible person either. You're a sinner just like Thomas. So what does God do with sinners like Thomas and you and me? He meets our outrageous demands. 
He comes to us and shows Himself to us. We have Judas the betrayer and Peter the denier. And that's just a few of these examples that there are many more of, of the unincredible spiritless disciples. And we know when we read through the Gospels that really the disciples never understood the mission of Jesus, even while walking next to Him and hearing all the stuff He says. One moment they think they've got it, and then Jesus congratulates them, except He doesn't congratulate them. He instead thanks God in heaven for revealing it to them. And then the very next moment, foot in mouth. They get it wrong. Obviously, the example that most people think of is from Matthew 16, where Peter rightly confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then a few verses later, Jesus calls him Satan and tells him to get out of his way. Because Peter's not an incredible person. He's just a human being. And then we have Luke chapter 24, the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Jesus has died in Jerusalem, and they are leaving in despondency and despair because the one who they thought was the Messiah, it turns out, was just a regular person, or so they think. Then Jesus, what does He do? He doesn't let them walk off in their despair. Instead, He shows up next to them. Somewhat humorously, they cannot see or understand who He is, which happens a number of times with the resurrected Jesus. There's something different about him that they don't recognize. And he opens up the scriptures to them and then reveals himself through the breaking of bread. And then, of course, in joy, they run back to Jerusalem. We have Judas's betrayal. Again, it's hard for us to imagine walking with Jesus all this time, knowing what we know, knowing what Judas must have heard, and he betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Why? Because Judas wasn't an incredible person. He was a sinner. We might do the same. And then we have Peter's denial in Matthew 26. And a small group of people in a courtyard while Jesus is being tried before the religious authorities, somebody says, hey, I recognize you. You were walking around with Jesus, weren't you? You're one of his disciples. And three times he's accused of being a disciple of Jesus and he denies it, and that last denial with an oath. And then the rooster crows, and Peter weeps. Why does Peter weep there? He weeps there because the reality of who he is is revealed to him. He's not an incredible person or a dynamic spiritual leader. He's a coward and a sinner. John 20 is Thomas's unbelief. And often we call this doubting Thomas, but the Greek is pretty clear. He's, he doesn't believe, he disbelieves. He doesn't doubt something he believes, he just disbelieves. And Jesus rescues him from his disbelief. But then we get many of these same characters today. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, the helper, the supreme helper, the Holy Spirit, has been given. The loud rushing wind, the tongues of fire, the speaking in tongues, the amazement of the people, the accusations of drunkenness. And in the midst of all that, amongst this gathering of thousands, once they receive the Holy Spirit, they begin to speak. And notably in verse 14, Peter steps up in front of the eleven and begins to address this crowd. Verse 14, but Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. This is the same person who denied even knowing Jesus in a small courtyard of people. And now he's standing in front of thousands, and not only is he standing in front of them, but he specifically wants them to listen to what he has to say. And then he begins his sermon on Pentecost. Probably the single most effectual sermon in the history of the church. It all went downhill from there, I suppose. At least I've never had 3,000 people come to faith after I've preached one sermon. But Peter did. 
And if you've read Peter's sermon on Pentecost, it's not an easy one to preach. It's one of those sermons that when pastors are called to preach it, you approach it with fear and trembling and worry because you know that somebody's feelings are going to be hurt and their sensitivities offended because they're going to be told they're not an incredible person. They're a sinner in need of Jesus. And that's what Peter tells them. He tells the people of God who've been waiting for the Messiah that they, in fact, killed the Messiah when they put Jesus on the cross. And the text says they're cut to the heart by what they hear. And they ask the only logical question that maybe you've asked when the reality of who you are has been revealed to you. What do we do? What option do I have? What is left? I denied even knowing Jesus. He told me I was going to do it, and I told him I wasn't going to, and I did anyways. I'm supposed to tell my neighbor about Jesus. I'm supposed to be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in me. Sometimes I don't feel ready. Sometimes I'm not sure anybody knows I have this hope in me. What do I do? But what changed today? What changed for Peter and the other disciples? Did they finally understand Jesus' mission? Did they finally sit in that room and put together the pieces of all the things that Jesus had said? No, they didn't. Because the disciples aren't incredible people. What happened is they received the Spirit of God. The Spirit of truth was given to them as a gift of grace in Jesus. Often when I was reading the gospel reading that we have for today, you kind of gloss over the fact that Jesus knows His disciples are sad, but He has to go. And the reason He has to go is the only way God is going to send the Spirit of truth to a throng of unincredible people is if the only incredible person who ever lived asks Him to. And so Jesus goes to plead on our behalf. Verses 16 and 17 of chapter 14 in John, And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another Helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. You know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. That is your hope. That is your joy. That's what Peter's talking about when he says, be prepared to give people a reason for the hope that is in you. Just about a year after I came to Ascension, I went to the Eastern District Convention. And one of the speakers there was highlighting the fact that often we confuse that our faith is something that we find or create. And so he just asked the very simple question. He says, why do you believe in Jesus? And there was a bit of a pause. And then a pastor raised his hand and said, well, because he died on the cross and saved me from my sins. And the presenter said, that's not why you believe in Jesus. You believe in Jesus because He sent you the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't even know to say the answer that that pastor gave. Nor would you believe it even if you did know. But happy birthday, church. God has a gift for you. He did send you the Holy Spirit. He does now dwell within you, and because of that, you can join that pastor in confessing that Jesus died on the cross to save you from your sins and rose victorious over sin, death, the devil, and the grave forever. Verse 4 of our Acts chapter 2 reading puts the order correctly. Here's what it says. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. First the Spirit, then the speaking. 
Just like I was sharing with the children that if you don't drink water, you die. If you don't have the Spirit, your faith cannot live. So today we celebrate in thanksgiving that we have indeed been given the Spirit, the very Spirit of truth from God, given through the means of grace which He has given His church in word and sacrament, a gift generously poured out on you in your baptism when He placed His name upon you. So I ask you again, were the prophets, the kings, and the disciples incredible people? Are you an incredible person? Am I an incredible person? Are pastors in general incredible people? The answer is no. We're not. We're like the disciples. We don't understand or believe in Jesus by ourselves. It isn't through some putting together of the facts and deciding, oh, that makes sense to me. Only by the gift of the Holy Spirit can I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and God. Only by the gift of the Holy Spirit could Jesus' hand-picked disciples confess Him as Lord and Savior to a crowd of thousands and then to the ends of the earth. So happy birthday, church, and thanks be to God in Christ Jesus because He has sent that helper to you and He is with you forever. As Lutherans, we practice what we call the means of grace. In baptism, the Holy Spirit was given to you. In the celebration of the Lord's Supper, that faith created by the Holy Spirit and sustained by Him is nourished through the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus. And by the Holy Spirit's grace, we are able to hear the Word of God and believe it. That is why we gather here. We gather here because we're not incredible people. And we need to be with the one who is and the one who gives so generously to those who don't deserve it. So dear friends in Christ, fellow members of his church, God has poured out his spirit on you and he continues to do so daily in his word, weekly when you gather here through the gift of his body and blood. And he will do so forever until he comes again to make everything new. Happy birthday, church. In the name of Jesus, amen.